so glad that you are here and welcome to the services of the community of faith baptist church so we did have a very nice uh event last night we had uh a movie uh here in the in the, in the sanctuary at 5 30 and then we had uh, a musical concert with our own robert vieira along with rick uh, v, uh rick uh, lazarte yes, <laughs> and the other rick rick garcia taking care of that. We had some folks and we had a few visitors kind of listening from a distance and just had a good time. And uh, it was nice and cool at 7.30. We're mostly in the shade and uh, there was a breeze. So that worked out well. We'll do that later for the next couple, three months. And, uh, you know, so that, that was nice. Uh, enjoyed that very much. For all those on social media, Facebook, welcome to the services for Community of Faith Baptist Church. We're glad you're here with us. And if you ever have any questions of me or our church or want to find out more information, you call the office. Uh, Nora is here each day, and we will get in touch with you. So thank you for being here this morning. God bless. Continue to remember our, our people. Uh, many of our people are still uh, watching virtually and, and not coming. Uh, you know, immune system things and all that, and I totally respect that. We miss them terribly, but we also know they're with us in spirit. And uh, got some things planned. We're going to be calling all of our members. I'm going to find and make the time to call all of our members and, and get their help with, with ideas and things we're doing to, to try to get the word out that we're here and, and why we're here to be a gospel witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone needs the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way of salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And thankfully, we have a God that our Creator God loves all people, created in His image, and has a strong desire for all to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And that is our primary focus. The Great Commission is in three parts, and it starts with teaching the world, starting in our community, uh, about what Jesus Christ has done for them and God's answer for their sin needs. And we're going to preach a message this morning on the Christ life principle and principles from scripture that tell us why we're here and our sense of purpose to remind us that no matter what's happening, even things that are confusing, even things that we don't understand, which is for me, I'll tell you, is most of the time. I don't always understand what God is doing, but I trust him and I walk with him and I desire to be used of him in a great way. And so we have a purpose for living. Nobody has a greater purpose for a living than a born-again child of God who mm. understands why they're here and understands that we're here this long compared to eternity and that God is going to use us and wants to use us in a greater and greater way. So we'll be preaching on that this morning, the Christ life principles from the Word of God. So let us sing and worship some more after we pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the salvation we have so freely in Jesus Christ. So thankful, Lord, for the grace that you've provided for me. And even as a teenager, when at one time I cursed your name, that you still had mercy upon me, and you still kept working with me and brought people into my life to share the gospel to, and got me to the place where I could turn from my sins that I knew and accept Christ as my Savior and know that I have eternal life. I'm so thankful, Lord, for your amazing grace. And Lord, I pray that this church can be a beacon of that amazing grace in many ways, reaching people with the gospel and seeing people come to be baptized, not to get saved, but because they are and want to make that public profession 
that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. I so thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In Jesus' name. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of His affliction, eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affection are for me And know how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so talk about the five W's of prayer. I'll go ahead and tell you what the five W's are. Who, what, when, where, and why. Great job. Two of y'all were saying them with me. That's awesome. 
Every morning, I like to read the newspaper to keep up what is going on in the world. Do you ever read the newspaper or your parents read the newspaper? Or they might even, nowadays, you do it on the computer, so they might do it on the computer, pull up the caller times. Did you know that the people who write the stories for the newspapers have a special way of deciding how to write their story? Well, here's what the reporter does. To make sure that the facts of the story are complete, a reporter makes sure that the article answers five important questions. Who, what, when, where, and why? When we read a story, it is good for us to ask ourselves those same questions to help us fully understand the story. And just like when y'all get invitations to birthday parties, your parents get them to weddings, baby showers, they all have that same five things, right? Who, who the party is for, what, what it's for, and where, when, and why. Right, guys? So we can use that in, this, in the same way. Today, we're going to read some verses from the Bible. Those verses were written by James, the brother of Jesus. In these verses, James is teaching about prayer. That's what we're talking about today is prayer. After we finish, let's see if we can answer who, what, when, where, and why questions about the prayer. Let me open my Bible here to James 5, 13 through 20. The prayer of faith. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I was reading James 5, verses 13 through 20. Okay, y'all ready? Y'all paying attention? Everybody awake? Brian. Brian. I can't see you. Okay. I was just making sure. I thought you were sleeping. Okay. Who should pray? Anyone, right? Everybody, right, Brian? Everybody. Good job. Good job, Brian. What should we pray about? Anything. Skylar got that one. When should we pray? Every day, any time. Where? Where should we pray? Everywhere. Brock got that one. Anywhere. That is right. Why should we pray? That's right. Skylar got that one because God answers prayer. Good job, guys. Y'all are really paying attention today. The five W's of prayer. Who? Anyone. What? Anything. When? Anytime, where, anywhere. Why? Because God answers prayer. Y'all did a great job this morning. Thank you for paying attention. Let's pray now. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Help us to remember that you want to heal us when we are sick. Help us when we are in trouble. Forgive us when we sin. And rejoice with us when we are happy. Amen. The Christ Life Principles. That's the message this morning. <clears throat> and these pretty much summarize why we're here. I came across an article by a man named Dr. Dale Turner in MSC Health Action News 
in 1993 in July. And it was, I found this interesting regarding our purpose for being here and why we're here and, and uh, you know, how our lives should be filled with the things of God. Because God is the one that created us. He knows how to fill the vacuums that so many people are looking for. So many people, great people, smart people, wise people, rich people, successful people in the world's eyes, but yet they, they reveal that they're empty because nothing can fill the void that's missing except God, except the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he wrote this. John. He said, John W. Gardner, founding chairman of Common Cause, said it's a rare and high privilege to help people understand the difference they can make, not only in their own lives, but also in the lives of others, simply by giving of themselves. Gardner tells of a cheerful old man who asked the same question of just about every new acquaintance he fell into conversation with. You know how we say, how you doing? How you doing today? You know, those kind of greetings that are normal. He would always say, what have you done that you believe in, and are you proud of it? And he just got into the habit of, of asking people that question as his greeting. What have you done that you believe in, and are you proud of it? He never asked conventional questions such as, what do you do for a living? It was always, what have you done that you believe in, and are you proud of it? It was an unsettling question for many people who had built their self-esteem on their wealth or their family or their name or their job or their career or whatever. Not that the old man was a fierce interrogator. He was delighted by a woman who answered, I'm doing, good, doing a good job raising my three children. And a cabinet maker answered, I believe in good workmanship and practice it. And another woman who said, I started a bookstore and it's the best bookstore for miles around. He said, I don't really care how they answer. I just want to put the thought in their minds. They should live their lives in such a way that they can have a good answer. Not a good answer for me, but a good answer for themselves as to why they're here. That's what's important. And when I came across that, I also came across this. It, it, I don't know who the source is, but getting to the scriptures. The Bible idea of the Christ life, the Bible idea of what a Christian life should be. In faith, he is a believer. In heart, he is obedient. In character, he is a saint, separated from sin by God. In relationships, or in relation, he is a son. In conflict, he is a soldier. In the world, he is a pilgrim, because his home is not here, but in heaven. In the darkness, he is the light. In earth's population, he is the salt. In the vine, he is the branch. In his walk, he is a living epistle, a living letter. In expectations, he is an heir. At all times, out and out for Christ. And that's a, a beautiful synopsis of the Christ life. The Christ Life Principles is not something that I read in a book, although there's, there's probably a book out there called The Christ Life Principles. I haven't looked it up. But all those are just from my study of Scripture. All those are just principles, great principles of the Word of God. And if we're striving for those things, listen, our life is going to be full. Our life is going to be purposeful. Our life is not going to be rudderless. Our life is going to have a clear direction for life. The first one is repentance and faith. That's where it starts. And Acts chapter 21 gives us that. It's more than just a principle, of course. It's the truth. But it summarizes, it capsulizes the gospel and what salvation is. Some people say that John 3.16 is the summarization of the gospel, but it's not really because it doesn't deal with repentance. It's dealing mainly with belief. But Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, Paul summarizes the gospel. And he says, I preach the same thing. He first says, to the Jews and the Gentiles. That's everybody. It's not just for a select few. The gospel 
has always been intended for every single human being because every single human being needs Christ. And so Paul says, I preach the same thing to the Jews and the Gentiles. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Acts 20 and verse 21 says. And Paul is speaking that to several, I don't know how many, but a, a group of pastors that were pastors over the Ephesian church. I think Timothy was for a long time the main senior pastor, but it became a very large Gentile church. And Paul had the pastors uh, of that church meet him in Miletus, if you read Acts chapter 20, on his at the end of his uh, second or third, I think third missionary journey. And he gave them these instructions, and that was part of what he said. So we need to be about repentance and faith. We can't skip one. We can't forsake one. And in our modern day, there is much easy believism. Are you a sinner? Well, most people are going to say, yeah, I'm not perfect. I've done things wrong, right? Most people. Are a sinner? Yeah. The God, well, the, the Bible says that, that the wages of sin is death. Do you want to be separated from God in hell? Most people don't. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? I can believe that. Okay, then say this prayer. But the problem is that the sin that God's Spirit wants to convict them of so they can turn from it and truly believe by faith and receive the gospel is never dealt with. Many gospel tracts today that are given out there don't deal with that. You have to deal with that. It's not about numbers, how many people, how many notches I can put on my belt and say, I led 330 people to the Lord this year because I said, do you want to go to hell? No. Do you believe in Jesus on the cross? Yes. Do you believe you're a sinner? Yes. Say this prayer. Uh, I, I accept what you did for me. But yet they still live in their sin because the Spirit of God, although convicting them, they have not responded to that. And so if repentance wasn't important, why would Paul say, I preach the same thing, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it's a part of the gospel. It is a part of biblical faith. It is not a work. It is not earning my salvation. But it's something the Spirit of God does because none of us can ever turn from our sins, which is what repent means. None of us can ever turn from our sins unless the Spirit of God convicts us. Because man is depraved in his sin. Without God's Spirit convicting him and drawing him to receive the gospel, man will not. But when the Spirit of God does, man can. And I did, and I trust that all of you have. When Jesus came on the earth and John the Baptist before him, as far as preaching, they preached the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And who's the ki how is the kingdom of heaven at hand? The king was there. Jesus was there. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. The same thing Paul said. And so nobody is saved, whether it's a child. And you have to be really careful. Those of you that minister to children and, and, and groups that minister to children, it is so easy for a child will be scared of, of hell. You don't want to go there. You want to believe in Jesus? Yes. But that, that I can believe a child can be saved, but the child has to understand repentance and faith. The child has to understand what sin is and desire to turn from it because the Spirit of God has convicted that child and they receive Christ as Savior. We have to be careful because many people, if you have done any ministry all to adults, they're hanging on to something that happened when they were four, five, six years old and they got baptized, but their life doesn't show much evidence that Jesus means anything to them. But they're hanging on to that experience. They need to be able to hang on to the fact that, that I turned from my sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so vitally important. And so we need to be sure that our gospel involves those things. Turning from your sins and accepting, believing on, trusting in, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins. It starts there. You can't go to heaven without that. You can't please God without that. You can't be one of his children without that. And so there it starts. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1031, the second principle, do all for the glory of God. Do all for God's glory. 
And that verse says, as Paul's discussing things in chapter 10 to the Corinthian church, he says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, in other words, in what you say or what you do, in words or works, there's a, I think the book by Dwight Pentecost is The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I did not say one word or perform one work without my Father, without being in obedience to and submission to God the Father. And that's the example for us. So whatever you're thinking about doing, Paul's principle is this. Whatever you're thinking about doing, whatever avenue of life you're in, whether it's a business that you run or a business that you work for or in politics of any kind, political leadership, uh, nonprofit leadership, for business, for profit leadership, family leadership as a father and mother or grandmother and grandfather and leadership and direction, in all things that you do, in personal pursuits of interest and in recreation, in all that we say or do, do all to the glory of God. That's a guiding principle. If it can't glorify God, then don't do it. If I can't watch a football game and glorify God, then I shouldn't do it no matter how much I love it. If I can't go fishing and glorify God, then I shouldn't do it. If I have to skip church in order to play in a golf tournament, and this is the Lord's day, and we regularly assemble as we're commanded to do, but I really want to play in that golf tournament, and it's on Sunday, and I choose to do that, that's not bringing glory to God, is it? That's me wanting what I want in the flesh as opposed to knowing how important my life is in Christ. Forget I'm the pastor. The pastor kind of has to be here, right? You, have you, some of you heard the story about the golfer or the pastor that was an avid golfer, and he called in sick on Sunday because he really wanted to play this particular round of golf. And he's really not that good. He's kind of a hack. You know, usually shoots in the 90s, maybe 100. But this day, I mean, every, every shot was like a pro, and he shot a 67, which, if you don't know anything of the golf, is really, really good. Only the pros typically do that, right? And so the Lord is talking to the angels, and they're asking, why did you let him do that? You know, why did you let him do so good? And, and the answer was, well, who's he going to tell? Who's he going to tell that he went and played golf on Sunday? And, you know, I love golf. I'm saying golf because I love golf. But if I can't play golf and, and glorify God at the same time, then I don't need to do that. I shouldn't take a job. That that job is not going to glorify God, no matter how much money I can make and no how much power I can receive. If I'm a politician, whatever I stand for, it's got to bring glory to God. And that's our problem in America. We have too many politicians on, on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, that, that their decisions and their thoughts and their stands have nothing to do with the glory of God. The greatness of this nation depends on our following the biblical foundations of right and wrong that I believe our founding fathers, not all of them great Christians, but all of them having a knowledge of the Scriptures that was a foundation for why this country is so great and the rules and regulations and things that were established. John Jay, who was the first chief justice, and there's a John Jay University in New York City, I believe, he said that, listen, we should all strive to follow Christian principles and ideals in our leadership. And many of the founding fathers, many of our earliest leaders, earliest politicians said the same thing. Again, I'm not saying they were all Bible-believing Christians. Some of them were, but they all had knowledge and, and understood the wisdom of the Scriptures. So as a child of God, as you go about your life, whatever you're involved in, whatever you will be involved in, that's the first point that what I can do is going to bring glory to God. If it's not, then why am I wasting my time pursuing it? If it can't bring glory to God. And that's the principle there. The next principle is the golden rule. We dealt with this in a sermon a couple of months ago. Matthew chapter 7 and tw verse 12, a passage that most people are familiar with. I had a missionary friend who's with the Lord now. He died in 2013. His name was Dr. Roy Dearmore. Well, it still is as far as God is concerned, but Dr. Roy Dearmore, great missionary, great man of God. 
great friend of mine, died of a heart attack in, at the age of 80. And he, on the side, he was a real estate broker. And the name of his business was Golden Rule Realty. And he lived that, tried to do right, tried to honor the Lord. It was a great example for me. Golden Rule Realty, Matthew 7, 12. Whatever you do, treat people the way that you would want them to treat you. Treat people the way that you would want them to treat you. That's not the exact phrase, but you know the scripture in Matthew 7, 12. You can look it up. Now, there's no parameters there. It doesn't say, you know, unless the guy's a real scoundrel. Unless the woman is a real Jezebel. And just using, you know, I hope nobody has a relative named Jezebel. But, you know, unless this person is, is your enemy and they're purposely trying to hurt you, there's no parameters. It's treat all people, including your enemies, the way that you would desire to be treated. That's the principle. That's how we live our lives. That's how it's possible because the Spirit of God is in us. In Matthew chapter 5, when it says to love your enemies, do good to them that use you and despitefully persecute you. Pray for them. Not just, I mean, pray for them for real. In the flesh, I can't do that. And I don't think you can either. But in the spirit, you can. Because you have a new spirit. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, that new nature, that second birth that you now possess, that is able to obey the word of God, given by, the, given by God himself. So we can do it. And so if I, you know, if I'm running for something, it will be hard for me to, to desire to turn, tear them down, tear them down. I have to be able to point out their, their bad policies and why that's bad for the country, why that's bad for people, but not make fun of them, not tear them down as people, not get laughs at their expense. And that's happening on CNN and Fox News. That's happening all over the place, and that doesn't honor God. Because that's not how they want to be treated, is it? That's not how I want to be treated, is it? But it's there for us. That's the golden rule. That's a principle to live by. Would I want to be treated? Would I, would, would I want to be spoken to the way that this person has been speaking to me? And it's ticking me off. It's making me angry. And I can't seem to get it to stop. But keep going to God. But you know what? You love them. And you treat them and speak to them by the power of God the way that you want to be. And you know what Romans chapter 12 says around the end of the chapter? It says when you do that, it can some, oftentimes reap coals of fire upon their head. And many people have been saved because of that kind of love. By following that Christ-life principle of the golden rule. Treating people, all people, the way that you desire to be treated. And all these principles, it's not just in church. It's not just in the home. It's everywhere. It's on the job. It's on the golf course. It's on the beach. It's in the mountains. It's on the political forums. It is everywhere. That's the thing about the Christian life. It's not lived in here. It's lived out there. That's the field. This is not the field. This is where we go to get our batteries charged up to go back into your fields, your personal mission fields. And some of those people on your personal mission fields, friends, family, coworkers, college students, business people, etc., miscellaneous, some of those people may be enemies. I'm not putting them on the list. Yeah, put them on the list and pray for them. And contact, why? Because you love their souls. If God loves the most wicked of people and desires them to be saved, then that's, we have the power to do that as well. The golden rule. Fourth, the extra mile. Going above and beyond. Going above and beyond. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 40, he was explaining, if somebody smacks you in the face, 
turn the other cheek. Somebody steals your cloak, give them your coat also. And then he says, and you know the story because I used this in a message several months ago as well. If somebody compels you to go a mile, go two miles. The Roman soldiers, real quick, the Roman soldiers could, were allowed to compel by law a common citizen to carry all their heavy gear for one mile. But after one mile, the citizen could stop. But it blew their mind. It would blow their mind if you said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep carrying it for you if you let me. I just want to be a blessing to you. Whatever. You know, that gets attention. That's going the extra mile. That's where the phrase comes from. There are a lot of things we say, and going the extra mile is one of them, that come from Scripture. There are hundreds of them. People don't know they come from Scripture, but they do, and that's one of them. Going the extra mile. Going above and beyond on your, for your employer, or if you're in business, for your employees, for your students, for your children, for your church members, for those people in your personal mission fields. Go above and beyond. Don't think of your service in the church as, well, I've done my part. There's never a place in Scripture for, I've done my part. You see that where it says unprofitable servant there in the, on the board? Let me tell you what that's about, in case you don't remember. Servants would go and they would work in the field and they would take care of, their, uh, of the people they worked for and they would prepare their meals. And that's, if that's all they did, Jesus said they were unprofitable servants because all they did was what they absolutely had to do. You know, if you're interviewing something and the, and the person you're interviewing asks several times about my specific job description, do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? You know, you probably may not want to hire that person because it looks like they're only wanting to do what they have to do to get paid. Where you're really looking for a person, especially if it's your business or you're the manager and you want to succeed, you want to find people that will be passionate about what they're doing and want to go above and beyond and not be an unprofitable servant, but be a profitable one. And so the extra mile principle is in your life. Do all you can and then some. Work, labor, especially in godly pursuits, and especially for the benefit of your family, for the benefit of your children or for your parents. Do all you can. Do the best you can. Be the example of what it means to work not for men, but for the Lord. Amen? Paul said, don't, to, to employers, employees, don't work as men pleasers doing eye service. In other words, when the boss is around, but do it for the Lord who's always around. Do it for Him. Do it for His glory. And you'll be one of the best employees, if not the best employee they have, or the best person they have, or the best mom, or the best dad, or the best grandparent, or the best person, or whatever, the best church servant, the best committee member, whatever the case might be. It encompasses all. Do all. For the glory of God, yes. But you bring glory to God by doing by going above and beyond, by going the extra mile. Fifth, the weaker brother principle. The weaker brother principle. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 13. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. The whole chapter is about this. It's about being mindful of those newer in the faith, those who don't understand what you do. Will it confuse them? Will it cause them to stumble? Will it cause them to go backwards? Will it cause them to doubt? It matters what we do and how we live. And it also and matters for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul summarizes it in verse 13, because the whole deal was eating meat. So they would have these the meat, some of you know it already, they'd have these meat that were offered to idols in the in in, in, in Corinth and all the other cities with the paganistic religions. And that meat would be offered up to idols. And after the offerings were done, the meat would go back to the meat market and be sold at a discount. You know, the Walmart discount section with the yellow sticker. Okay? Because Best Buy, this day, I just found juices out there. Best Buy, March 2019, in the trash. They're probably, it's probably fine, but in the trash. But yeah, with meat, you don't want to eat meat that's Best Buy, March 2019, right? So this meat was discounted because it was used and they wanted to get it sold. And Paul was, Paul was a steward. He used money wisely, tried to, 
And so he would use this meat. Then he realized that some of these newer believers were thinking, okay, well, I guess it's okay to offer sacrifices unto idols. Paul probably explained it to them. Listen, I'm, I'm a pastor. You can explain something to someone, and, that, and whoosh, whoosh, it doesn't mean they get it. It doesn't mean their heart gets it. It doesn't mean they want to listen. It doesn't mean they want to hear it, even though they nod their head yes. So Paul said, well, I'm not gonna, I can see this as a problem. Now, maybe in the future, maybe some years down the road, he might be around just more mature Christians, and they might be able to do that. But for that time, Paul said in verse 13, Wherefore, if meat makes my brother to stumble, I will eat no flesh, no meat, while the world stands, unless I make my brother to stumble. That's a principle. And we need to be mindful of that and what we do and who we are and how we live and what we say and the jokes we tell because precious new believers, precious other believers can be affected. You want them to be affected positively. God cares about how we speak. He says, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. And so there are jokes that I've heard and I find them funny because I'm, you know, I'm a human and I've heard them. But I can't tell them. I don't want to tell them because they're dirty. They're not clean. They're not pure. And so, no go. Because it doesn't bring glory to God. He tells us to, that our communication should be with grace, seasoned with salt. Because we are the salt, as we read in that at the beginning of the message, to the earth we are salt. The gospel we preach the morality, that, the good biblical morality that we proclaim and seek to live. It helps this earth. It helps this world. It helps this community, even though they may not understand it. But here specifically, the weaker brothers, to help them to grow in the Lord, to do all we can to be sure that we all grow together, strong in the Lord, honoring Him, worshiping Him, that that community of faith, Baptist Church, becomes more and more of a church that's known for the way it exalts Jesus Christ in all that it does. And that's the principle. That's the principle. Now, the sixth and the second to last one is one blood, especially in this day and age. One blood. Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. The Apostle Paul is preaching to the Athenians on Mars Hill at the Areopagus. And these are all pagans. These are all philosophers and, and paganistic philosophers at that. They're all Gentiles, and Paul is preaching to them, and he says, listen, there's no one group of people that's better than another, because we're all created in Adam in one blood. We all have the same blood. Now, I know we have O and A and B, but you know what I mean. We all have the same life blood that lives within us, Way back in Leviticus, God revealed to us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Right? The life of the flesh is in the blood. God is no respecter of persons. We preached on that too several months ago. God loves each person, desires each person to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Now, God's judgment comes when he is rejected and other people are hurt, when the widowless, when the widows and the fatherless, the orphans, when they're hurt, God's word is clear. Judgment will come, but it always comes in God's time because God is also merciful and long-suffering, desiring for those to repent and believe, principle one. But judgment will come. And eternal judgment will come as Christ is rejected. We see that most clearly in Revelation when we see those folks in, during the tribulation period that are following the beast and, and worshiping him and have taken his mark and are persecuting Christians and are killing Christians and are shedding blood and hate God and ultimately judgment comes, they will be destroyed. That judgment will fall. But even before it falls... Even as the heavens are open, then Jesus is preparing to come down slowly to the earth and bring that judgment. He still cares for every soul, and we don't know that there might not be some people there having heard the gospel before, 
having heard the gospel from the, from the tribulation martyrs, having heard the gospel from the 144,000 sealed Jews, having heard the gospel from the two angelic witnesses, or by some other means, that when they see that happening, they fall on their knees and they repent and they accept the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It wasn't too late for the thief on the cross, and it's not too late for them. It's only too late when death comes. Then their judgment is sealed. Then that spiritual death they're living in becomes the second death, and they will be separated from God forever and ever. <coughs> in my lifetime, I have seen churches, Baptist and otherwise, churches that would not let certain people in their church, certain racial people, certain people of different races in their church. And that's sin. Matter of fact, anybody is welcome to come in and visit our services. Now, there are some things for membership that the Bible talks about, but as far as somebody coming to our church, whoever it is that might, you might be scared of the most, whoever it is that you might find the, you know, the most difficult, everybody is welcome. And by, when, I'm, when I'm talking about difficulties and things here, I'm talking about people who might want to harm you or, or people who might have an agenda, but we want them to hear the gospel, amen? We want them to know, whoever they are, that if they're coming here to hear and listen and consider, that they're welcome to hear the truth about Jesus Christ, to see people that should care about them and glad they're here and desire for them to come back and desire for them to come and know Christ if they don't know him. But that's a principle we need to live by. All people are equal in the eyes of God. God is no respecter of persons. He says it multiple times. God created us all. We're all created in his image, and he loves us and desires for us to love one another, especially of the household of faith. Because Paul Jesus said in John 15, or is it John 13? I think it's 15, that people, one of the main ways people will know about him when they see the love we have one for another as God's people and showing the difference that Jesus makes in our hearts. Amen? The final principle this morning, basically trust and obey. That quote's not from the scriptures as far as I know. That quote is from a hymn. Trust and obey. But in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, if you want to turn there, uh, Solomon, who had God-given wisdom above anyone else that ever had it, save Jesus Christ, of course. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the last chapter, the last two verses, and again, I'm a horrible Bible turner. I'm getting there. There's Psalm, uh, past, before, uh, there. Uh, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs. I should have put my ribbon in there. You know what I'm saying? Song of Solomon, there it is. Chapter 12. He summarizes everything. He says, this is the conclusion of the matter. And here's the duty of man following God. Verse chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Or chapter th or verses 13 and 14. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the matter, of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Jesus said the same thing. Who's God, right? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Fear God. That involves honor and reverence and trust. Walking with him. Having a holy reverence for him and who he is. Because the writer of Proverbs says, Solomon, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. And knowledge as well. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom, as E.K. Begley, my old pastor, used to, who's with the Lord now, used to say, wisdom is the right application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. You get the knowledge of the Scriptures. A lot of people have knowledge of Scriptures, but they never apply it. So there's no wisdom. But whether it's knowledge or wisdom, it starts with reverence for the Lord. The fear of the Lord, trusting the Lord, honoring the Lord, 
And so the song says, trust and obey. And then the second part of what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes is keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commandments. He said, if you love me, you will keep my words. Same thing. This is the guidebook. I'd be lost without it, wouldn't you? It gives us the road map. It's the original GPS to life. It shows you how, where you're going and how to get there. And it doesn't accidentally take you down some private road where a guy with a shotgun is going to come out and say, get off my property, which has happened to me. Well, not the gun part, but the being on the private property part. In Oregon, I lived in rural, I pastored in rural, rural Oregon for five, four, four, four and a half years. And maps, you know, GPS did that to me. I was new to GPS and and it took me down gravel roads, and I learned later that those gravel roads were owned by that guy's ranch or that guy's farm or that guy's house and, and, and property. And they were kind of sick and tired of people doing that. But God's GPS for your life, it's going to lead you into some places that are tough. It's going to lead you to some places that are trying. It's going to leave you in some places that are going to test and prove and hopefully grow your faith in Him to be more and more like Him. But it's not going to lead you astray. It's not going to lead you into the wrong place if you follow the map and you obey Him. Obey these principles. If you just have these principles memorized and you live by these principles of Scripture, it pretty much just encompasses the Word of God because it involves loving people. It involves trusting God. It involves <clears throat> doing, going extra for people. It involves treating people the way that you want to be treated. It involves glorifying God. It, involve, it involves seeing all people as, as important or more important than you are. I meant to say that. The Bible doesn't only teach us that we're all equal, but the Bible also teaches that I should have, if I'm a, if I'm a God-fearing, serving, mature Christian, that I'm seeing the needs of others above my own. I'm seeing there that God has placed me there to help other people to grow in the Lord and to make their lives more wonderful and to trust God with my own life. It's not about me. It's about people. It's about the Lord. And what's the Lord all about? Being a blessing to people. What did Jesus come to do? I came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why He came. He came to sacrifice Himself. Yes, not only on the cross, but to sacrifice everything that he had, all the power of deity, and become a man, and live as a man, with the realities, and the, and the weaknesses, and the, and the sweat, and the cold, and the hunger, and the pain, to become us, as it says in Philippians 2, emptied himself, and became flesh, and by the way, is still in a body of glorified flesh for our sins. So that's what these principles are about. Are we, are we living that in our personal mission fields? We need to. And reaching out to people, letting them know we care, having a prayer ministry for all the people in your mission field, and then calling them back or emailing them back or getting back with them and say, how is, how is this happening? I'm praying about it. What's happening? Oh, it's, it's the same or it's worse or I don't know what God's doing, but let's just keep trusting. We'll keep praying because God is on the throne and He has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. Have you ever trusted Him as your Savior? Has there ever been a time when you saw your sin, you felt like the Spirit of God, or somehow you knew you were a sinner and you knew you had to turn from that, and then you said, Lord, you died for me. I put my trust in you and I will follow you. Has there ever been a time? Or... You know, we're all going to die sometime. What happens if you go to sleep tonight and you don't wake up? What happens if you die tonight? Do you know for sure? You know what? The Bible says you can know for sure. And I do know for sure. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the grace of God and Jesus Christ. Amen? Father in heaven, as Rick comes forward, we'll have a time of invitation. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would 
take this message, guide and direct us, Lord, those that are watching, those that are here present, that they would come to you in prayer. They can come to the altar here and kneel if they wish, or they can pray in their seats or pray at home. Father God, this first principle we covered of the way of salvation, repentance, and faith. Has there been a time in their life when they have been convicted of the Spirit? And he does it often. They can't understand it, but they know that something is wrong in their life. They know that they're sinning. They know that they need to make this right. And someone has told them about what Jesus did for them. He paid for every single sin. So whatever it is in their life that they know to be sin, I now want to turn from it and put my faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me and the sacrifice he made. And he's my living Savior. Pray that you would do that this morning. And if you do, let us know. Let me know. Let our office know. Come to our church and be a part of letting other people know that this church might grow and be filled with the people that God wants to be here because the Bible tells us specifically that God places every member in the body. We want those people to come and to serve. And we want to see as many people saved as possible to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, to have the joy of knowing that their sins are forgiven and have peace with God.